say 10 years. This is 10 years of ups and downs. This is 10 years of falls, slips, jumps, ups, and it's, it's honestly a difficult path. But he eventually, after all those years, after all those challenges, after all those circumstances, he still ends up being elevated by God, still. This shows that God, God is still with us. God is still with us. And God will bring that elevation even in our trying time. Let's look at another Bible character who ended up seeking elevation throughout his life. David. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, from verse 16 to 23. From verse 16. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on an harp, and it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David, thy son, which is with the sheep. And as we can see, if we go through that passage, they eventually find David, and he comes to play for Saul. If we skip to verse 23, it says, And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an heart and played with his hands, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. You can see here, this is another example of elevation. David started as a shepherd boy in the fields working for his father. Eventually throughout your li his life, you saw that he was eventually, through God's help, was able to slay Goliath and defend from the Philistines. Here again, we see his gift from God of playing the harp, where he uses it to help the king, Saul. And if we go through David's life, we'll eventually see that he becomes king of Israel, which is another example of elevation. Now, when you see, when you get to an elevated stage, you start to make, you tell people things how they are. If we go back to the interpretation of Baker, the Baker's dream, it was not a favorable one. It can be bitter sometimes, the truth. Some people don't like it because it's not what they wanted to do. They reject it. But when God elevates you, you see that God gives you this duty to tell people how things are and what the situation is. You see the color white? It's white. You look down at this carpet, Someone asks you the color, you say red. That's how you are when God puts you in an elevated position. If we see here, some people may feel like when they are not at that elevated stage yet, they might be seeking out this position, this popularity. They might be looking for that next promotion. And, you know, because they're trying to make sure they're okay with everybody, they just, you know, something's happening. You know, this person may not be doing the best thing at the job. Someone might not be managing the money well, but, you know, oh, I'm looking for that position. You know, I, I, I can't say this now. But that will not be you in Jesus' name. You'll tell people how things are. Another part of this elevation is humility. We see it when he gets to Pharaoh, Joseph, gets to Pharaoh's house. When Pharaoh asks about how he's able to provide the interpretation, it's not him. He brings it to God. He knows that throughout his whole journey that 
It wouldn't have been possible without God. That is another characteristic you gain from elevation. Now the question is, Joseph was able to get this elevation. What about me? What about us? Well, if we go back to our equation, we see how we can get there. First is God. We need God in everything. If you don't have God here today, my prayer is that you'll find God in your life and you can get to that elevation. We'll go to our second part of the equation, me. How can I help God? Well, you help God by letting God help you. After we see this elevation, we find God. We see that we'll be a blessing to others. For Joseph, he blessed others through his interpretation. For you, it might be different. You might be a good teacher. You might be able to explain things well. You might have really good connections in your field, and you might be able to help people find a different area, get to a different level. On a day like this, we all praying that God will elevate everyone in Jesus' name. Now, my question is this. Who wants this elevation? Can I see a show of hands? I'm sure that everyone wants it today, and we we'll hope we'll get there in Jesus' name. So, to conclude this, let's look at some keys to divine elevation. Number one, we already talked about it. Remain humble. If we go to James 4, verse 6, it says, God resists the proud and gives more grace to the humble. Number two, being fearless. If you look at the life of Joseph, when he eventually got to Pharaoh's house and he was put in charge of managing all the food before the famine, he didn't have this experience. He just came out of prison, but even though he was put in this situation where he was uncomfortable, he still took it and made sure it happened in Jesus' name. Number three, be fully trusting in God. This is another biblical key for maintaining this elevation. You have to continue trusting in God. Don't give room to doubt. For example, as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus when he was walking on the water, he was above the surface, he kept going. But the moment a little doubt came into his mind, he started sinking. That can be seen in Matthew chapter 14, verse 29. Number four, be obedient. Another key part of this elevation. You can see that when Joseph got to Potiphar's house and he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, he thought in his mind, how can I do this great wickedness? He knew that committing that sin was not God's plans for him. This was not what God wanted him to do. So we go to number five, which is remaining faithful. Again, throughout the whole journey, all the trials, he was still with God. And we hope that that will be you also in Jesus' name. We can see that Joseph was prayerful in his life because in order to maintain the relationship with God, you have to pray. That is the only communication you have. So we can be assured that he's a very prayerful person and you also would be prayerful in Jesus' name. So let's take this to the Lord in prayer. Talk about elevation. How can we get there? How can we receive this elevation? How can we have God in this equation to make sure it works? If you feel like your relationship with God isn't solid or you just wandered a little bit away, talk to God today. Bring him into your life. This is the time. Throughout all the things that happened to Joseph, kept God on his heart. Even in a situation where it felt like he should be furthest away from God, he was as close as can be. But 
for you, you might not be so close, but this is the time to get closer. For those of us who have strong relationships, the battle is very long. It's a marathon, not a race. The devil is always trying to separate us from God. Pray for a strengthening relationship. Pray for God to keep you in this battle, keep you in this fight throughout our Christian race. God is asking, God is asking for us to accept us, to accept him into his heart, our heart. God is asking, God is knocking at the door. As we go to me, my role, Again, we need to keep God in our lives. Keep God in our lives. Keep the relationship strong. Keep the relationship going, even when it feels like this is not the time. This is the time to stop. This is the time to figure something out. This is the time to go on vacation. This is the time to just quit. That's the time for it to be closer to God. Keep us close to God, Lord. We're asking and praying for elevation in our lives. We're asking for elevation in anything we can think of. Our spiritual life, our financial life, at our job, in our business, in our families. We're asking for this elevation, Lord. After we go through these first two steps of the equation, Lord, we're asking for your elevation in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord, we thank you for this service. We thank you for this message. We thank you for this day where elevation has been our theme. Lord, we're praying for this elevation in our lives. We're praying for this breakthrough. We're praying for us to break through boundaries, Lord. As we go through our Christian journey, Lord, bring this elevation in our lives in Jesus' name. To keep this elevation, though, we need strong relationship with God. The Christian wish is a marathon, it's not a sprint. Help us to keep through that marathon, even when we're tired, even when you feel like it's time to throw in the towel, keep us going in Jesus' name. Keep us in this race and help us to get our elevation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That was awesome. Praise the Lord. We're already enjoying the favor of Joseph, and incidentally, his name is Joseph. Amen. Praise the Lord. Shall we rise on our feet as we pray for these young people? Um, we didn't plan to do this, but all the youths, can we please file out in the front here? Whether you participated today at the program or not, let's file out in the front. Our parents want to pray for us. So let's raise our hands, stretch forth our hands towards them as we pour out God's blessings and anointing upon these young people. Let's pray for the favor of God to be increased upon their lives. All the youths, whether you minister today or not, can you please come to the front? As our parents stretch forth their hands towards them, let's pray for more grace. Let's pray for more unction. Let's pray for more of God's visitation upon their lives that they will, not, they will never go down that they will continue to go up and higher and higher 
that the favor of Joseph will be upon them, and that everywhere they go, doors will crumble before them. There will never be any closed door against them. The Lord will open, the open door for them will be established, and nothing will be able to hinder them from getting to the point where they need to be in life. Let's pray that the Lord will keep on lifting them up higher, higher and higher every day, higher and higher every day, from grace to grace, from power to power, from anointing to anointing, from blessing to blessing, from open door to open door, that the Lord will help them to achieve and to be able to fulfill the, their destinies. Nothing will cut short their destiny. Nothing will cut short the plan of God for their lives. That every evil plan of the enemy against them will be thwarted, will be destroyed, will be disorganized. That every vicious cycle of the enemy that is trying to entangle them into any bondage, that the Lord will shatter them today. The anointing of God upon their lives will increase. That by the reason of the anointing, every yoke upon their lives shall be broken, shall be destroyed, shall be rendered rootless, re re shall be rendered useless in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's begin to pray. Let's begin to pray. Let's call upon the name of the Lord upon their lives. There will be a divine intervention in their lives that whatever they lay their hands upon to do shall prosper. God will make them. The next generation, they are ready. They are ready to take the mantle. They are ready. I believe God that the Lord has prepared them. They are ready to go to the next level. That the Lord will equip them. All that they will need, all the wisdom, all the grace, all the anointing, all the blessing, all the resources that they will need to be able to move forward in life, to be able to do exploits. They that know the Lord their God, they will be strong, they will do exploits. That the Lord will cause them to know him more and more, so that they will be able to do exploits, so that they will be able to be strong and strong and strong, and nothing will make them go down in the mighty name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. They may go back to their seats. A round of applause. <laughs> Amen. We may be seated. With this, we have come to the end of the youth day for today. And we give God the praise, the glory for everything that he has done for us today in Jesus' name. We thank God for these young ones. At times, you may never know the potential in somebody until you give that person the opportunity to display that potential. At times, parents, oh, sorry, my, my child, you can excuse him in this and that. I don't think she'll be able to do it. Sorry, ma'am. Sorry, sir. She will do it. So whatever we give them to do, just leave, let them, leave them between them and God. As some things were assigned to them at times, it looks like, I don't think she, yeah, God can do all things through them, through Christ that strengthens them in Jesus' name. So we're not underrating anybody. We believe that God, the, what God can do in their life has no limitation. Amen? So we want to give a shout out to some of our great leaders that have made this day a reality, starting from our region of Asia. Um, yes, a round of applause to him is our father. We thank God because of the vision. And we are where we are, we are, we are today because of the vision of God upon the life of his servant our region overseer, Pastor Michael Dada. And um, we thank God for his ministry, and we thank God for how God has been using him, even supporting us in the youth ministry and the youth section in this church. So we thank God and we pray for more grace, more unction, and more vision of God upon his life in Jesus' name. Again, we thank God for our resident pastor, Dr. Charles Odochu. A round of applause to the Lord Jesus. Thank God for him who has been holding forth, standing in the gap since our region overseer is uh, over there in the Philippines, and we thank God for him and um, how God has been using him mightily in this place. For giving us the opportunity today to have this uh, great day, the youth day, we say thank you. And we are looking, um, we are looking forward for more. I, I believe we are not asking for too much. Amen. Praise the Lord. And again, I know today will not be possible with, uh, without some of our great parents in the house. Amen. A round of applause to yourself now. Yes, yes, some of our parents, all of our parents, you all have done great. This day wouldn't have been possible, would not been, we have been able to do anything without you. At times we call them, oh, we need to meet, some of them will be texting me, sorry, I'm running late. My parents, yeah, we understand your parents for now, you, don't, you can't drive because of some of legal things, but we know that your parents are the ones you want to rely on to get you from point A to point B. And we thank God because they're never disappointed. When we call, 
for meetings. Our parents are on time. They bring the children around. They release them, and they've been highly supportive. Parents, we say thank you for that support there in Jesus' name. And again, I also want to give a shout out to some of our young adults who were highly supportive. Um, Sister Esther is there. Sister Chamaka, yes. Sister Chamaka too. Uh, but Lucy, yeah, we we're all here, you know, from time to time on Zoom, yesterday here, and this morning, they're all on, here on time. And without these young adults too, today wouldn't have been possible. They've been awesome. Amen? So we give God the praise because of them. And again, we thank everybody here. I uh, will not mention you because if this place didn't have anybody here to listen to the ministration, who are we going to be ministering to? We'll not be ministering to empty benches, right? So we thank God because of you. I mean, you that is looking at me there. Maybe I didn't mention your name. Yes, give a round of applause to the Lord. I didn't mention your name. You were also awesome. Be here supporting us through prayers, resources, and other things. We are highly elated to have you here in our midst, watching us and being part of this ministry. And above all, we also, I mean, the biggest shout out now goes to the Lord God Almighty. And then the youth, yes. Give him the praise, give him the glory. Because without God giving us life, the gift of life, giving us the grace to be here, we'll not be here, right? Thank, we'll give him the thanks, yes, amen. So he is the one that makes all things possible. Without his grace and the way he orchestrated things, we will not know him. There are some people somewhere now who are struggling with addiction, struggling with different kinds of things, but God has set us free. Amen? We are free, and we are free indeed. And we have the confidence to stand in his presence, to worship him, and to give him the praise. And we're believing God that these, our young ones, they will go places in Jesus' name. And, I mean, I don't want to end this um, vote of thanks without mentioning those three people that won the Kahoot competition. I, I saw um, one of them, Obok, right? I don't know Obok, where Obok is. I, I want to greet Obok for being, I think, number three there. Yeah, let's give him, okay, yeah. Oh, Brother Samuel is the Obok, okay. Let's give the Lord a praise here yeah, for him. Yeah, and we also saw Hope. I think Hope was there. I don't know where is hope, and then maybe charity will follow him. So, oh, faith. Oh, sorry, faith. Oh, faith, your, uh, your hand. Can we see your hand? Wave to the Lord. Give the Lord a wave offering. Okay, I see Sister Faith there. Thank you. And then we saw um, Cheap, right? Cheap, can you give? Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. So permit me to hand over the, uh, the mic to the man of God, our pastor, Dr. Charles Odochu, so that he can close us out in prayer and for some important announcements. A round of applause to the Lord Jesus as he comes on to take the stage. Thank you. Praise the Lord. If you've been blessed, praise the Lord. I want you to say God plus me equal to elevation. Say it one, two more times. Plus me equal to elevation. God plus me equal to elevation. All our youths, the ones that ministered, the ones that didn't minister, those at the back room, we are trusting God. God plus you will equal elevation for your family, for you, number one, for your families, and for this church, and for this nation, in the mighty name of Jesus. Can I hear louder? Amen. I've never been that impacted of late. That message was impactful. Simple, straight to the point, but impactful. I know somebody else has been impacted here today. I live here with that impartation because I know I'm, going, I'm elevated. God bless you. We thank God for all the ministers that ministered from the beginning, the opening prayer, from uh, the songs, for everything, everything. They were instrumental, the wonderful sisters, our uh, wonderful brothers, and we were trusting God that God will continue to use them more and more in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, they keep getting better and better. And the better and better they become, the more opportunities they get. 
Amen. Amen. Are you all waiting for more opportunities? I guess the Lord will bring you away in Jesus' name. Praise God. Before we leave, uh, I want to ask us. Now, it's more like a rhetorical question. How many of us are willing to go to Philippines this week from tomorrow? There's GCK uh, coming up in Philippines tomorrow. You're ready to leave tonight. Arrive there tomorrow and start action in Philippines. Now raise your hand. After the beautiful songs that our young people gave to us, you're not a man, oh. You are the one that opens the door, no man can shut. He has opened the door in Philippines. I said, how many of us are ready to leave tonight and from tomorrow head to Philippines? <clears throat> anyway, since you're not able to go to Philippines, you're not ready to act by faith and take action from tomorrow. April 22nd, we're going to be waiting on the Lord. It's going to be prayer and fasting to shape the nation of Philippines for Christ. It's going to happen daily from Monday, that's tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the climax is going to come on Sunday. I know, though you couldn't go to Philippines, you can't go to Philippines, you can be part of this one. Can you be part of this one? If you can be part of this one, can I just see you wave your hand? You can be part of this one. You know how the gospel spread abroad, moved everywhere. People made sacrifices. Even our young ones that minister today, if they tell you how many hours they put into this work, just to minister three hours today, they, almost the whole of yesterday, they were almost they were here from 11 all the way the previous Sunday, were here just to give their best, their best, for God. Why won't God bless them? He will bless them indeed in Jesus' name. So starting from tomorrow, we will begin prayer and fasting for GCK Philippines. It's a national, regional prayer fasting. And what that means is we will be meeting here uh, 7 p.m. daily. So 7 p.m. I know there's Bible study. Now because of this, the Bible study is going to, for tomorrow, will start later. So they we meet here at 7 p.m. in person. And we're streaming to the rest of the region. Those who cannot meet in their locations will be joining us. And we're going to be praying for one thing, that Philippines will be saved. We're going to be praying for revival in Philippines. We're going to be saved, like the general superintendent said many years ago, Africa for must be saved. And that prayer cause the church to be planted in many nations of Africa. So 7 p.m. tomorrow, be here. We will wait on the Lord during the day. One thing is the prayer, singular prayer for Philippines, salvation for Philippines, and we come together at 7 p.m. We'll do the same thing on Tuesday. We'll do the same thing on Wednesday. We'll do the same thing on Thursday. Thursday, the GCK called in Abia State begins. It's going to the prayer meeting is going to be part of it. We're going to come here on Thursday, 7 p.m. We'll start for that. It's going to be regional. Regional church will be part of that prayer. We'll start at 7. We'll pray till 8. Just music, uh, praise worship. Uh, what do you call that? Not praise worship. The choir, administration straight to the GS message. So we hope by 9.30 for each of these days. By 9.30 for uh, the GCK days by 9.30 we will be done. For other days, Bible study, I believe by estimation, by about 9.30, we should be done. But Tuesday, one hour, 7 to 8, we're done. Wednesday, 7 to 8, we're done. And Thursday, the cycle will continue. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How many of you will be here? You're ready to make sacrifices sacrifice to be here i want to see your hand you're ready to make sacrifices not for bread and butter but for salvation of souls jesus said, i came to seek and save the lost if you're ready to be i want you to rise up on your feet rise up on your feet you're ready to you know uh minister today said god plus me
No, there's some sacrifices that you're forced to make. Persecutions force you into those things. Uh, affliction forces you into those things. At times, difficult times, family limitations force you into certain things. Sometimes it's your health that forces you down and you cannot help yourself. You can't go to work. You can't go anywhere. You are just stranded. And all you can just do is open your mouth and just pray where you are. But the best sacrifice that any of us can make is a sacrifice made out of convenience. Convenience. You have the willpower. No wonder today people don't give God their best. They cry to God when they're in problem. But when you have the whole beam, the whole totality of you, you can walk, you can do other things, but you say, God, the first place in my heart, the first place of my time, out of the dollars, the mammon of dollar in America, the, uh, the opportunities in America, the, uh, what do you call that? The groceries, I can enter there, the fast food and everything. My job, my pleasant job, despite all that, I am separating myself and I'm going to go and wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. The people who do such sacrifice or make such sacrifices are the people that God zeroes in on to lift up. And I say that to you. Some of us are thinking about it. It's quite heavy. Think about it very well. Think about it. They will not gather because of some sort of emergency. May we gather for more of things like this. Praying, waiting on the Lord for souls to be saved. And as we call on the Lord, while he may be found, we'll be found of him in Jesus' name. Only some of you said amen. I said only some of you said amen. Some of you said amen. Can I have a louder amen? The Lord will help us to come to pass in Jesus' name. So at this moment, I want to ask all the workers to wait behind. It's going to be very brief. All workers, wait behind. So I will see you very briefly. Let's rise up as we share the grace in fellowship. Now, before the grace, I want you to say, God plus me equals elevation. I'm holding on to it. I believe it. As I live here, I'm going to run with it. Now the grace. The grace for our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Now turn to your neighbor. You know that one is not going to just come, it's not going to just fly from your mouth. Now, not just, I, I don't want you to turn to your neighbor. Now, go to somebody in this church, and everywhere is full here, almost full. I right, to continue to be full and full and full until there will be no seats to take anybody. Now, I want you to walk around, look at people face, eyeball to eyeball. If it's somebody you've met before, skip the person. Now, walk around. We have a few seconds to do that. Walk around. Get up from where you are. Walk around. Walk around. Walk around. Walk around. And before you say the grace to them, you say, before you say surely, you're going to ask them what their name is. Walk around. Walk around. If you've met somebody, say, no, 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 move on. I know you. Move on. Walk around. Ask them, how are you doing now? Tell them, God plus you equal to elevation. This is my year of supernatural elevation. Uh-huh. I can see you're happy. Joy and plus happiness will lift you up. More joy, more happiness in your life. More excitement in your life. God will so bless you. God will so elevate you. When we say, let's go to Philippines on vacation for mission, you will be so elevated. Is a pastor, even next hour, I am ready to fly. Now tell them, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Now tell them, you will dwell in the house of the Lord. How? Forever. Forever. 
forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Can you move like this? Summer, winter, autumn, spring. Mountain, blue skies and the sea. Rainbow, sunshine and the trees. Jesus, the maker of them all. Jesus. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy Clapping Year in Jesus' name. Amen. That means he will do it for you, for me, for everyone. Let me talk to our people on the other side. Bill Lucian Park. Il le fera ce qu'il a promisé. He will do everything he has promised in Jesus' name. This year, the trees of the field will clap their hands. The members of his church will clap their hands. 
the promises of God will be fulfilled in every life this year in Jesus name all the things we have cried about all the tears in his bottle the answers to those problems to those challenges those answers will come in new year happy healthy progressive powerful conquering this is your year father in jesus name we thank you and bless your name for your goodness we know that you have come to bless your people this year and we pray beyond our prayer beyond our expectation beyond what you have done in the past you will do even this year in jesus name open the windows of heaven open the doors of heaven and bless your people abundantly this year in jesus name we well, thank you lord because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray give me another shouting clapping amen god bless you you can sit down tonight we come to our second sunday in this a new year and it is a covenant sunday and i pray that covenant blessings will be upon every life even today in jesus name we're coming to jeremiah chapter 31 and i'm reading from verse 33 it says but they shall be the covenant that i will make in the with the house of israel after those days says the lord i will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their god and they shall be my people now we're talking about contract a contract a covenant they're similar. When God makes a contract or a covenant, there are two sides to the covenant. We have the side of God. He is the covenanter, covenantal. And then we have the side of his people, the covenantees. The people on those two sides, you have the document that states the promise the performance and what is going to happen and the condition that you have to meet between the covenant and the covenant and it states the condition there that this is what I will do but you have a part this is what you will do it's like uh, the marriage covenant that the husband has a part and the wife has a part and it is the fulfillment of those uh, covenant conditions that will bring the blessings upon us here god now himself talks about the covenant and he talks about the part of the covenantees the people who are the beneficiaries of that covenant and so he says this is what i will do in any contract in any covenant that's a writing so that the person making the covenant initiating the covenant can look at that document and say this is what i said and this is the blessing i said i will give and this is your part and so he gives us the covenant and he says i will write that in the heart of the people that are making covenant with me it says they shall be the covenant that i will make he is the originator of the covenant he is the one that tells us what the promises are what the conditions are and he says after those days says the lord i will put my law in their inward parts it's a covenant that makes him right his word his covenant the promises the expectations the conditions 
in our heart so that every time we'll be remembering this is what he said this is what he promised and this is the expectation coming from him that we will have to do. Look at verse 34 there. In verse 34, it says, And they shall teach no more. Every man is neighbor. Why? Because he has written the covenant conditions and the covenant promises and the covenant precepts in our heart. It's put them on the table of our mind. And so you don't have to come and remind me. I don't have to come and remind you when that thing is written clearly in every heart. And it says, and every man is brother, saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them. He said, there'll be nobody just coming as an onlooker. There'll be nobody coming as a spectator. Everyone will know me. Everyone will be born by the Spirit of God, born again and belonging unto the Lord. And they have their hearts with the Lord and they have their minds in the Lord, and they have the law of God in their heart. It says, because they shall all know me from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Look at chapter 32, and we're looking at verse 38. In chapter 32, verse 38, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. But you understand, that's not automatic. It says, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. There is a condition that he has given. is the condition of repentance, is the condition of restoration, is the condition of regeneration. A new life in any man be in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things have become new on that condition that we repent on that condition, we are restored to the original situation. How Adam and Eve totally belong to the Lord before they fell, he said, they shall be my people and I will be their God. In verse 39, he tells us, and I will give them one heart. I will give all of them the same kind of heart. Think about Enoch, the same heart he had. Think about Samuel, the same heart he had. Think about Jeremiah, the same heart he had. Think about Paul Peter that laid everything on the altar and totally committed themselves unto the Lord. That's the same heart I will give everyone. It says, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. Then in verse 40, it says in verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, all of them. All the people that have covenant with the Lord, he'll put honor. The honor we give to the person we respect, we hallow, we honor. And the fear, the filial fear that we have towards God. And we're conscious of his honor. We're conscious of his, of his glory all the time. Because of that, we fear to offend him. We fear to contradict him. We fear to influence any other person around us to go against the Lord. In any way, we never forget ourselves because it's written in our heart. The, the value and the virtue of following after God and helping other people, encouraging other people to, uh, to fear the Lord. It says, I'll put my fear in their hearts and they shall not depart from me. They'll not be Sunday, Sunday Christians. Sunday, Sunday believers in the market, they will not depart from me. 
in the home they'll not depart from me in every action every action of their hands they'll not depart from me that the covenant the lord is making and today we're looking at the heart of the new covenant the heart of the new covenant everything has a heart if the heart is deformed if the heart is weak if the heart is unstable if the heart is not active doing what he taught to do it will affect the whole body and if the heart of the covenant is tampered with then it will affect the fulfillment and the performance of the covenant the heart of the new covenant we're looking at three things here number one is the heart Number two is the healing. Number three is the holiness. Number one is the cleansed heart. Number two is the confirmed healing. Number three is the crucial holiness. Point number one, the cleansed heart for the everlasting covenant. The cleansed heart. You bring your heart to the Lord. This is my son, my daughter, give me your heart and as you bring that heart he cleanses the heart he purges the heart he prepares the heart for inheriting the possibilities and the promises in the covenant number one the cleansed heart in the everlasting covenant number two is the confirmed healing in the new covenant it was in the old covenant and it comes to the new covenant and christ has now become the sacrifice and our substitute and the one that helps us to have the healing benefit in the new covenant number two is the confirmed healing in the new covenant number three the crucial holiness crucial holiness that's what crucial means important it's something you cannot deal without it means essential when you say something this is crucial this is important and this is indispensable this is an essential commodity number three then is the crucial important essential indispensable holiness in the holy covenant let's come to number one now number one is the cleansed heart for the everlasting covenant let's look at that again in jeremiah reading from chapter 32 and we're looking at verse 38 in jeremiah chapter 32 verse 38 it says and they shall be my people and i will be their god then he tells us in verse 39 in verse 39 and i will give them one heart the heart they had before i have to replace that heart all those children of israel and they came out of the land of egypt and they were going to the land of canaan if they had had a cleansed heart if they had had a consecrated heart, if they had had a heart that focuses on me, not on them, not on their bread, not on their water, not on their needs, if they had focused their heart on me, they would not have perished in the wilderness. 600,000 men that came out of the land of Egypt and then the, those who had wives and then children that's why we calculated the number of the people about three million that came out of the land of Egypt just the younger generation were able to get there why because he said I will circumcise your heart and the heart of your children so that you will love me with all your heart all your soul and all your mind they didn't take their heart to the lord to be circumcised and then their children they didn't tell their children the importance and the significance of that circumcision of heart but now he says they couldn't enter in because their hearts were not ready. Now he says, and I will give them one heart and one way 
if we have one heart, we'll have one way. If we have one heart, we'll have one passion. We'll have one path. We, because we have one heart, one vision, one decision, one dedication. And we have one decision to follow after the Lord. Now, as we talk about our having covenant with the Lord, that's what he wants to do. First of all, he wants to give one heart so that you can follow one direction so that you can have one goal one ideal one purpose and you want to go that same direction that god in heaven has marked out for us and that christ has described very well the narrow way that leads to glory land and he says i'll give them one heart I'll give them one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. Then in verse 40, it says in verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them that I will not turn away from them. He turned away from the children of Israel and he abandoned them. He said, all right, your heart is not with me. Your heart is not for me. And he went to the land of Babylon in captivity. But now he says, I'm going to have this everlasting covenant with them that they will not turn away from me and I will not turn away from them to do them good but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me and then in verse 41 verse 41 yea I will rejoice over them to do them good and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart my whole heart if they follow the lord with their whole heart then god said with his whole heart he'll bless them if they bring their soul their mind everything and they're serving god without reservation all their soul all their mind all their heart if they serve him without reservation he too will bless them without reservation it says with my whole heart and with my whole soul and that's how abraham had the blessing of god because he came to god with a faithful heart he served the lord with his whole heart there was no reservation there was no looking back everything he knew you know the bible was not reaching at that time and Yet, look at Abraham. Abraham, here am I, Lord. Take that son, your only son, whom you love, and go sacrifice him to me. It says in the mountain that I will show you. And the very early morning, the first day, uh, the, 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 the next morning, he rose up, took the son without consultation without compromise without discussion and he had those servants with him and then he took the son and laid the wood on him and he took the knife and the fire and then he went to the mountain that the lord that should, with all the heart all the soul without any reservation and then he told those servants tarry here i will go yonder and worship the lord and we both of us he believed that the covenant of the lord will not change he had told me that through this son it will make him a blessing to the whole world and now he told him to sacrifice the son he didn't delay dally. he didn't delay with all his soul with all his heart with all his mind he took that son and god said because you have obeyed me and you follow me with your whole heart i will bless you with my whole heart that's what he's saying look at nehemiah chapter 9 and i'm reading there from verse 7 nehemiah chapter 9 verse 7 thou art the lord the god who did choose abraham and brought him forth out of all of the chaldeans and 
gavest him the name of Abraham. Why? Look at verse 8. In verse 8, and foundest his heart faithful before thee. Foundest his heart faithful. You know, when you come to the Lord and we're making this a great covenant with the Lord, he must find our heart faithful. And it's out of the heart we have all the issues of life. You cannot repent without your heart going into it. And you cannot obey the Lord without your heart being totally submissive unto what God is saying. And when that's what God found in Abraham, that you found his heart faithful before thee and made us a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the Gagashites to give it, I say, to his seed and has performed thy words. You found him faithful in heart. And because he was faithful in the heart, you have now performed your words for thou art righteous in psalm 51 reading from verse 5 that's why the lord wants to cleanse our hearts so that in the cleansed heart that will have the performance of all the promises of the new covenant it tells us here in uh, psalm 51 verse 5 behold i was shapen iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Verse 6, in verse 6 it says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Then it says in verse 7, in verse 7, Purge me with Esau, and I shall be clean. For God to fulfill the covenant he had made him with David, he needed a purged heart, a pardoned heart, a purified heart, a cleansed heart. He says, put me with Esau, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. In verse 8, it says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Then in verse 9, it says, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Verse 10, creating me a clean heart. That's the prayer we need to pray. We need to make sure that our hearts are clean, we're purged, we're purified, and we have a heart made ready for the covenant, the covenant the Lord has made. He is righteous. Our hearts must be righteous. He's so purer eyes than to behold iniquity. And he doesn't want to behold iniquity every time we come. And what are you coming for? I come to claim the covenant blessings. But look at your heart. I need to cleanse that heart. It's a creating me clean heart to God and renew a right spirit within me. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're looking at verse 6. If, if he's to fulfill the covenant, he wants to handle that problem of the heart first. And he says in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. What does that mean? You know, circumcision of the flesh takes away the extra flesh you're brought into the world and uh, it's it will be a storage for bacteria bad bacteria it will be a storage for disease it will be a storage for um, you know things that will uh, disturb your whole system it goes from there to all the parts of the body now circumcision removes all that so that everything will be clear in the natural now the heart also has something it brought into the world it's called depravity it's called the Adamic nature. And that Adamic nature causes problem because as Adam made excuse, that nature of excuse making. Why did you do this? Excuse. How didn't you do that? Excuse. Couldn't you have done better? 
excuse. How about this? Look at the result and the reward and the, the consequence of your action. Excuse. It came from Adam and Eve. Never going straight. Never telling the truth. Never being transparent. We brought that Adamic nature, depravity, with us in the world. And we cannot do hypocritical, maneuvering, hunky panky what the Lord. We have to be straightforward. If we are going to be in covenant with the God who can see through, He can see everything that anybody is doing. And so He said, so that your heart will be cleansed and your heart will be pure, and your heart will be circumcised, ready for the covenant and making with you. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed. What the consequence of that? To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. When that cleansing has been done, when that circumcision has been done, you will love the Lord thy God above your comfort. You love the Lord your God above your comfort so zone. You love the Lord your God above your preferences. You love the Lord your God above money, above material things, because He wants to be the one you depend upon, you, you uh, dependent all the time. And then it says, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. Look at verse, uh, verse 19. In verse 19 it says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before thee life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. You see, the, the covenant is not imposed on us. No, not at all. It says you have a choice. I want to bless you. There's a personality that doesn't want you to be blessed. And that personality works with your heart. He knows what you will do that I will say, okay, my covenant is no more with you, but you have a choice. There's life, there is a death, and there is blessing, there is cause to choose life that you may live. And then he tells us in verse 20, in verse 20 he says that thou mayest love the Lord thy God with all, and then that thou mayest obey his voice, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land, which the Lord thy God swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. He expects that we will love him with our hearts, not with our head, not with our mouth, but not with words, but with action. Our action will show the thoughts of our heart, our disposition. It will be shown by what we do in our obedience to the Lord. And it is that kind of obedience that shows the cleansed heart and the, and the, and the consecrated heart and the circumcised heart for the covenant. In 1 Kings chapter 8, reading from verse 23, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 23, and he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above and or on earth beneath, uh, beneath. Then he says, who keepest covenant? He keepest covenant. If the covenant promises are not fulfilled in any life, in any family, in any local church, in any denomination altogether, if we are not experiencing the fulfillment, the performance of the covenant promises, the fault is not on God's side because he is the one who keeps covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee. 
with all their heart. Look at that all the time. You keep the covenant with the people that have a heart, a heart to follow the Lord. Not just religious people who just come to worship every Sunday, but their heart is not in the worship. The new heart is not kind of instilled, created in them. You fulfill the covenant with the people that walk before thee with all their heart. Look at verse 56. It tells us the outcome of people walking with all their heart before the Lord. Blessed be the Lord that has given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. Remember verse 23 we read for us, these are people that are following after the Lord with all their heart. And now he says that these people, they have the fulfillment of everything God has promised. And then he said, there has not one word failed of all the good promise which he promised by the hand of Moses his servant. We're looking at 2 Kings chapter 23 and we're reading from verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 23 reading from verse 1 and the king sent and gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. Then in verse 2 in verse 2 it says and the king went up into the house of the Lord and all the and, and all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all the inhabitants, all the citizens, everyone, and then it says, and the priests as well, and the prophets, and all the people, both small and great, both small and great great you know everyone is involved in the covenant and each one has to take his part and he has to give his heart unto the lord if it's a little heart little heart little mouth little hands give yourself to me if it's a big heart an aged heart give your heart to me anyone if it's a female heart give your heart to me if a male heart give your heart to me the lord deals with us not on the basis of gender not on the basis of age he deals with us on the basis of the heart and it says all of them small and great and he read in their ears of the words of the book of the covenant which was found in the house of the Lord and then in verse 3 in verse 3 it says and the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments that the heart he expects it's not just you know this is a covenant Sunday covenant month and we're here and we leave our heart at home and we leave our consecration behind and we leave our commitment behind and we leave the desire the passion for holiness and righteousness we leave all that behind and then we come for covenant there's no covenant without the heart you will bring your heart with you, a heart that is convicted, a heart that is converted, a heart that is consecrated, a heart that is cleansed, a heart that is totally committed and devoted unto the Lord. We must bring our heart, and it says they did that, and his testimonies and his and his statutes with their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant all the people stood to the covenant nobody was passive nobody just said okay go ahead and uh, you know finish the preaching and when you're finished i'm here i want this i want this pray for us yes we'll pray but you know we have to go through everything and know that this is what is reaching and then we we, we uh, give our hearts and we give everything we have according to what is reaching we're looking at it Ezekiel 
chapter 36, and we're reading from verse 25. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. It's God talking, not Ezekiel. It's not the water of Ezekiel. It's not the water of a prophet. It's not the water in the bottle. It's not anything that human beings have taken from the river. They put it in the bottle, and then they sprinkle it. Not, not at all. This is the Almighty God saying, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. And from all your filthiness, filthy language, all that will be cleansed off. And filthy behavior, all that will be cleansed off. And filthy exposure. There are people that expose their bodies. And you can see the contour of their body, and uh, you know, and they make other people feel defiled. All that kind of feel the appearance and feel the exposure, it cleans everything away. That, that's what God wants to do. And if you don't want to do that, and you want to continue in that feel the exposure, you are not ready for the covenant of the Lord. You are not ready for relationship with the Lord. It says, and from all your filthiness, and from all your idols, will I cleanse you. Anything you exalt above God is an idol. It might be a person, a man, a woman, exalt him, exalt her above God that's an idol. It might be your job, your profession. It might be anything on earth. It might be the dust and the sand of the earth, the cement of the earth. It might be property. You exalt above God. That's an idol. And God says, I'm not going to share my glory with any other person or with any property. That's why he says, as you come into a covenant relationship with you, he says, and from all your idols will lie cleanse you. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, and a new heart will I give you. And a new spirit. You see the heart there? is the heart of the covenant. And the heart that is made to inherit the covenant promises of the Lord. And a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And ye shall, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. God knows whether the heart is soft or hard. He knows whether the heart is the heart of Pharaoh or the heart of a Paul. Paul the Apostle. He knows whether the heart is habitually hardened or is permanently softened. And when he looks at you, you come, you say, you have a good intention, you come to me. But you know, he acts on his word, on principle, on precept. And if your heart is hard, it says, we have to take another step before you get to the covenant. We have to remove the stony heart. And he can do that. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. And it says, I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Brothers and sisters, it's the heart that makes the year old or new. The date crossing over from December 31st to January 1st, the date does not make the year new in any way. It is the covenant of the Lord. It is the conversion of the soul. It is the cleansing of the heart. It is the recreation of the heart that makes any period, any year, any time, any period of your life new. If you have the same old disobedience, the same old hardness, the same old unbelief, the same old self-will, and you carry the self-will from December 31st through to the crossover service, and then you launch on January 1st, on, in January, the first month of the year, and the same unbelief, the same 
disobedience, the same disregard for the word of God, the same old habit now that will carry to what we call New Year. You know, the, the thing keeps on moving. You have a vehicle. And you put the old kind of dirty fuel into the tank. Although it's New Year, but the vehicle does not know date. All it knows about the kind of fuel you put in there. And if you run on that same old fuel, you're going to have the same, the same result as you had in the old year. That's why God said the very first thing in the heart of the covenant. And he says a new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. Somebody will shout, Amen. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, and I will put my spirit within you. He wants us saved, verse 25. He wants us sanctified, verse 26. He wants us filled, immersed, enveloped, empowered, baptized in the Holy Ghost, verse 27. And he says, Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem. Until ye be endued with power from on high, from on high. If you have the same plastic attitude and the same uh, heart that will not wait upon the Lord, so that you can renew your strength. If you have the same hurry, 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 and you are not ever waiting before the Lord to be baptized and filled and immersed and enveloped and empowered with the Holy Ghost, the same weak life you lived in the previous year, the same weak life you lived today in the new year. But it says, wait, wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not faint and shall walk and not be tired. It says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them look at verse 36 in verse 36 i'm reading from the second part there the last line it says uh, i have uh, i the lord have spoken it and i will do it i the lord have spoken it i'll give a converted heart a cleansed heart a consecrated heart and a circumcised heart i the lord have spoken it and i will do it okay the lord will do it i fold my hand i say god i'm waiting you are not praying you're not seeking, you're not searching your heart, and you're not doing what ought to be done, and you just say, I'm waiting. Look at verse 37. In verse 37, thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I have promised it. Why are not sinners saved? Who they say God has promised salvation. If he wants to save me, let him save me. They're not kneeling down. They're not standing up. They're not repenting. They're not forsaking their sin. They're not believing on the Lord. Why are many believers not sanctified and their Adamic nature is not taken away from them? And they go from day to day, from week to week, from month to month, from year to year with an unsanctified heart, uncircumcised heart, because they're not asking. They say, that, you know, Christ has provided it and Christ has prayed and you know will be sanctified they're not praying that as you can tell it's not everybody that lives the sanctified life although they say Christ they believe in sanctification as a doctrine they believe that Christ has provided but they are not asking why are people not baptized in the Holy Ghost? Oh, God has said that, you know, I will fill you, I'll baptize you of the Holy Ghost, I'll put my spirit within you. But they are not asking why is it, you know, a church that has believed the salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism for nearly 50 years? Why are the majority of the members and the workers and the people, why are they not filled with the Holy Ghost? They say, God. 
God has promised it, Jesus only, Jesus ever, Savior, Sanctifier, Baptizer, the coming King, and they sing it every time, but they never pray about it. That's why their power is not there. He says, thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. And I will increase them with men like a flock. This year will be different. A year of praying. And that amen is low. A year of consecration. A year of new life. A year of total commitment unto the Lord, all our soul, all our mind, all our heart, everything that we have. And want to forget the old year and come to the new year with fresh kind of passion and desire and consecration and seeking after the Lord, praying until he does what he has promised it will happen in Jesus' name. It tells us in First John chapter 1, reading from verse 5. First John chapter 1, we're reading from verse 5. It says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all look at verse 6 verse 6 says if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth then in verse 7 it says but if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another fellowship with one another what does that mean? Like we're sitting down, there's no fellowship, and just sitting down, quiet, we're not talking with anybody, that's right, in service we don't talk with people, and we're not, um, you're particularly thinking of anybody, it's not fellowship, I'm going to the fellowship, I'm going to the fellowship, I don't think so, the fellowship is when your heart is considerate of him. Your mind is considerate of her. You're not thinking of personal self-satisfaction. You're thinking of, how can I bless him? How can I be a blessing to her? How can I cheer her up? How can I fulfill, be a part of her dream, to fulfill her dream? How can I show him, show her that somebody is here for you. I know your passion. I know your desires. I know everything you are thinking about, or maybe some of them, and I'm here to fulfill part of the goal that you have. That is fellowship. But when we just sit down, we're not concerned what happens to him. We're not concerned what happens to her. We're not concerned whether he's hungry or not. She's hungry or not. She has a problem or not. We're not concerned about that. We are so self-centered. Although we're in the midst of the people and we're sitting down together, we're not thinking of them. Their joy is not our joy. And we're not contributing anything to the progress of our life, progress of his life. There's no fellowship there. But then, if we say we have fellowship with one another, it says if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us, cleanses us from all sin. I pray this year there will be fellowship in our church. Fellowship. Fellowship. You'll know the person living next door. And when he's thirsty, hungry, sick, depressed, unhappy, having a challenge of pressure upon him, upon her, you will know about it. And the fellowship you give them, what it takes to solve their problems, then we will know we are a church in fellowship. Amen. Point number two now, point number two is the confirmed healing in the new covenant. The confirmed healing in the new 
covenant. The Lord is always interested in our body. He is interested in our spirit, in our soul, in our body. Why? Because our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And then he says, I will dwell in you. I will walk in you. That's why he's interested. Our body is not just like, okay, it's not important whether I feed the body or not. That's not important to God. It's important 